So really quickly before I uh, turn things over to French, I did want to just introduce him at a high level. French is the director of IT at Royal Technologies, and he has over 20 years of experience uh, in, in the field, in the technology field. And he leads Royal Technologies IT team uh, with a focus on aligning their IT strategy to the strategies of their business while improving the end user experience for his team. Um, he's a longtime client of InterVision, and he's joining us today, as I, as I said, to talk a little about his journey to the cloud as it relates to creating a more resilient workload through our disaster recovery as a service solution. So I'm very, very grateful, French, that you made some time for us today. I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn it over to you. How are you doing, French? I'm doing well and uh, really excited to be here. I know when I first started working on, uh, on moving our DR to the cloud, I had told Travis, uh, our account manager, that if we could get it working, that I would I would sing InterVision's praises from the mountaintop. So uh, consider this me singing on the mountaintop right now. And uh, yeah, just really happy to, to be here and share our story. I love it. Thank you so much. It's, all, it's always, always great to hear from a happy client. So just really quick up front, can you share a little bit about of your background at, at Royal Technologies? Uh, sure. Uh, Royal Technologies is a, a manufacturing company based out of Hudsonville, Michigan, uh, which is over on the uh, the west side of Michigan. So just across the, the big lake from Chicago. Uh, we, um, we've been in business since 1987. Uh, we serve primarily the furniture, automotive, and consumer goods industries with plastic parts. Uh, we do plastic injection molding. We do a little bit of uh, foam, as uh, well as assembly and engineering. Um, about 350 injection molding machines. So that's really where our, our core business is. Um, we're in three regions in the United States. Uh, Michigan, where we're headquarters, headquarters is, is uh, as, uh, also Alabama and Texas. So we're, we're all in the United States today. Um, yes, if, uh, if, you're, if you happen to be sitting in a, uh, an office chair that's made by Steelcase, Herman Miller, Hayworth, or Hahn, we probably have a, a piece of plastic on the chair you're sitting in. Um, customers on the automotive were considered tier two, so we supply suppliers that then in turn supply the uh, the big three automotive and some of the larger foreign um, automakers. And then on the consumer goods, everything from appliances to uh, lawn equipment um, to, uh, to to even uh, weapons, we, we do plastic parts for, for for guns as well. So uh, so we've got quite the the gamut. Basically, if if you're willing to spend a few million dollars on on somebody to make plastic parts for you. We would like to be your supplier. Got it. Awesome. Um, Thank you, Rich. Yeah, yeah. Just real, uh, just real quick. Overall, too. Just um, you know, we've got about thirteen hundred employees. Um, three of those employees work on our IT side for the systems. We do have a custom ERP system that is supported by five people. So, um, we're, we've got a relatively small and nimble team, and uh, that's I think that'll that'll kind of play in a little bit to the conversation we're about to have about why we were looking to move some of our DR stuff to the cloud. Perfect. Thank you so much for that segue. So, can you tell us a little bit about your your journey? You know, we we look at this this concept of resiliency um, as it relates to disaster recovery as a service. Yeah, um, I start. I've I early in my career, I hopped around to different places, and uh, every two years, I, I would basically find myself at a, at a new position, uh, learning something new. But I really found a home at Royal and started there as a network administrator. And only about three years in did I find myself actually leading the team and, and being responsible for all IT operations. At that time, um, I realized we really didn't have much in terms of DR. Uh, our DR plan was basically a lot of prayer and an updated resume, I think is what, uh, what we used to joke about. Um, we eventually started to um, create our own DR capabilities, but it was basically old equipment that we had moved to a closet at one of our other regional facilities um, that we were replicating some things to um, through through some more traditional backup software. Um, but we all knew in the back of our minds that uh, if, if we had if we had to fail over to that equipment, one, it may it may not work. Number two, if it does, it's going to be much slower than what people are used to in production. So we knew we had to really take that that next step up. Uh, in regards to disaster recovery. So at, at that time, we basically just went out into the market to see what was available. And we talked to probably eight different companies at that time. Um, what jumped out at us initially was most of the companies would come in and say, hey, whatever you want, we will do for you. Out of those eight, only one company actually said, hey, you know, we want to talk about your infrastructure to see if we're a good match. 
um, which caught us by, by surprise a little bit, but it was a good surprise because as, as we were talking, we realized that they had really standardized their process on how they delivered DR as a service, and they wanted to make sure that, that their solution matched our infrastructure, and thankfully it did. That, that company at the time was Blue Lock, um, based out of Indianapolis. And what they were really looking at was how virtualized was our infrastructure. And thankfully we were 100% virtualized in the data center. And this is, this is about 2014. Um, and some of the other things that we, we really liked about the solution is it, it relied on a piece of software called Zerto, which we hadn't, we hadn't been exposed to before, but we were really impressed with. It was literally the, the closest thing to magic we had seen since actually seeing VMware and being able to move servers live between hardware hosts. Uh, the RPO times were under 10 seconds. So, you know, if we had to fail over, we're only talking about 10 seconds of data loss potentially. Uh, so it, it was just this really compelling solution that fit really well with, with our infrastructure. So we basically signed the contract and, and moved ahead with them. And we had been a very happy customer with Blue Lock. And, uh, and then once uh, Blue Lock merged with InterVision, um, we learned that InterVision was bringing to the table a lot of these cloud capabilities. And the thought kind of entered my head. It's like, I know our contract with Blue Lock includes some hosting costs. You know, we're, we're paying roughly 70% of the compute and memory that would be necessary for us to, to fail over in a DR scenario. So if we could switch that and leverage some of InterVision's cloud expertise, I was wondering, could, could some of that cost be, be removed? Because in a cloud scenario, you really would just pay for the storage until you needed the compute and, uh, and memory capacity uh, to, to spin up during a DR scenario. So, I mean, it was only a few months after the, uh, the acquisition where I, I broached the subject with, uh, with Travis, and that, that started a series of conversations that, that lasted a couple of years. I think a part of it was, you know, it was a new acquisition, you know, InterVision had the AWS, Blue Lack had a lot of DR as a service capabilities. Um, and there was, I think, just some internal figuring out how that was going to mesh together. Um, but we, we all worked through it, we figured it out, and uh, it was actually interesting. Adam, um, I think it was, a, I can't remember his last name, it's like Scalhorn. Scalhorn, there we go who happened to be the same uh, engineer who helped to onboard us to the Blue Lock solution became our uh, engineer for this solution. And um, so we worked closely with him again and, uh, and came up with a solution that, that really exceeded um, our expectations in, in many ways. And, and that's where we're at today. We have a uh, full uh, DR solution that's replicating everything that's happening in our production data center to AWS using Zerto. Um, again, we're, we're still seeing sub, I'd say probably sub 20 second RPO times. Uh, the solution actually improved our recover, RTOs or recovery time objectives um, by 50%. So uh, before, I think our goal was around four hours. We can easily bring up our whole DR um, solution in less than about two hours or less today. Uh, we test it twice a year. And uh, once, we act, once a year, we actually bring an entire facility offline, test our VPN failover, we print labels, we move production um, uh, pieces from the warehouse to, to the shop floor, basically test just about every nook and cranny of our system that we can within about a, a half a day's time and then you know, reconnect everything, spin production back up, shut down the DR and high five everybody and, and head home for the rest of the weekend. So um, again, just, just been really, really pleased with the, with the solution. Thank you so much for that, French. And I, I thought it was great that you highlighted sort of that that journey that we went on as you know the IaaS hosted uh, disaster recovery as a service to the cloud hosted, and it really represents the cloud journey that as an organization Intervision has gone on, right? And the fact that we were able to provide that that service for you that leveraged our cloud expertise, I'm just really glad to hear it. It went well. Another thing that I think is really important, in fact, for folks in the audience here today, even if you're working with the recovery provider. I think that testing component and really making sure that the failover is working the way you expect is something that's, that's easy to overlook, as, as, as crazy as that sounds, and it's often kind of glossed over as part of the onboarding. And so I, I think, you know, really make sure you have a solution that you can test and that will work uh, when you need it, because that's certainly not a situation you want to be in. 
So, so with all that said, Fred, what were some key decision factors that you had along the way uh, in this process? Yeah, I alluded to it a little bit earlier was that a lot of the DR providers we, we spoke with early on in 2014, really didn't have a standardized process. And in my mind, that, that was concerning because I didn't want to be a unique run book that some you know, intern potentially would have to pull up and figure out how to, to, to execute it in order to support us during a, a disaster. Having the, the peace of mind knowing that our run book and the tools used to execute our, our disaster recovery for us were, were very, very similar, if not exact, from customer to customer with, with InterVision. Um, that, that provides me a lot of peace of mind knowing that the processes, the tools, and everything that we're using uh, for disaster recovery are standardized across InterVision's um, kind of customer base. So for me, that, that was very, very helpful. Because again, I just I just didn't want to be that that unique company that uh, that that somebody had to figure out how to how to assist when when we needed help the most. Great, yeah, that, um, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, the um, the other thing is just yeah, I mean, I, again, I mentioned it again was Zerto. I mean, the the software is amazing from a disaster recovery perspective and. And, and Adam and the team at Blue Lock and at InterVision, they, they know the tool really, really well. And uh, they've helped us learn the tool along the ways. I know our network engineer, Jeremy, now is very comfortable doing the, uh, the, uh, uh, the upgrades for the, uh, the different server um, utilities that we've got that enable the, the replication. Um, it's, uh, and they're, they're, the team is always there if we're ever having any replication issues or anything like that. They're all over it. They've got really great relationships with both the AWS and the Zerto team um, to, to troubleshoot any potential issues. And that was really key during the kind of the design of the solution. Uh, we ran into some unique situations, largely based on our workloads um, that uh, InterVision and AWS worked really closely with, with Zerto on to figure out ways to, uh, to speed up recovery, uh, speed up replication, um, those types of issues that cropped up along the way. And then, and then lastly, and just, just huge kudos to, to the Blue Lock InterVision team throughout our journey with them since 2014. The customer service with the group has literally just, just been outstanding. Um, when we first were onboarded as a customer, we were sent a digital photo frame of the, uh, the implementation team that was going to be assisting us, which I thought was a great touch. And to be honest, I was really worried about that transition as, as Blue Lock was acquired by InterVision. Um, but if, in honesty, I think the relationship is, is even stronger today than it was uh, before the acquisition. So I've been really, really happy with that. And Travis and the team that we work with has just done a great job. Um, we've, we've, they've maintained that kind of that culture of partnership and, and that relationship uh, just amazingly well through, through the entire transition. Uh, you know, we love to hear that piece, you know, technology is technology, but uh, it's really the people at the end of the day that, that make this happen. And we're very proud of our team. So glad to hear the relationship so strong. So what what is your um, organization learned through this process? Uh, to, uh, the, the primary thing is this project has really, I think, proven out that cloud has a very significant place in our overall IT strategy. The, when we first were looking at options in 2014, we considered building our own like fully capable DR site at one of our regions. So, you know, similar storage, similar compute, um, you know, we'd probably end up having to, to staff that. And when we analyzed it at the time, the 10 year cost between using InterVision and doing it ourselves was relatively close. I mean, it was, it was, a little cheap around the uh, on the intervision side, but not by much. Um, so then you fast forward to now and being able to 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 move that solution to the cloud, we're able to to leverage the economies of scale and the flexibility of the cloud, and we were able to do that and dramatically reduce the cost of our DR solution. I'll, I'll get into the the figures later, but it um, we wouldn't have been able to do that if we had invested so much in our own infrastructure. Uh, to support a DR scenario, the, the flexibility to, um, and basically it's all sunk cost. So at, at the end, you're, you're sort of committed to it, maintaining it and, and keeping it up. And the flexibility that the cloud has offered us 
in terms of DR, um, we're hoping that that flexibility also will translate as we move more and more of our actual production workloads to the cloud and, and get out of the data center business altogether in the future. Um, yeah, it's it's yeah, and it get, it kind of gets into that. Um, you know, today our, our our primary public cloud we're moving to is is Google, but AWS is going to be that our, our backup. So we're we're kind of approaching it as a, from a multi cloud perspective, and again, you know, being able to not only leverage it, Amazon and Google's multi regional data centers, um, and the replication between them all. I mean, it's going to offer a level of resiliency and and capabilities that we, we can't dream of today running our own internal data center. Uh, so we're, we're really, the DR was a great use case and I think a great example of the flexibility in the, of, of the cloud. And we're just really, um, we're glad that it proved out to the business because the business is even more behind us on, on the, the future of the cloud and, and what it can offer us. And um, yeah, we're just excited to, to keep exploring and, and heading in that direction. Yeah, I love that. And really, you know, that's one of the things we wanted to highlight here today. For those of you who are a little earlier in your cloud adoption journey, disaster recovery really is a great use case to build out and, and start to uh, frame out your cloud strategy uh, without putting your production workloads at risk and, and to really kind of get your toe wet, for lack of a better term, um, in the cloud and get some experience there. So. So French, last question for you. What, what value has your organization seen since making that transition from uh, to DRAS to the AWS cloud? Yeah, just kind of mentioned it, but it's it's kind of the validation of our cloud strategy, number one. And the, the big reason is that we were able to reduce our DR costs by 74%. I mean, that, that was the impact of moving it from an on-prem or a kind of a, a co-located solution to a public cloud solution. And that, that type of cost savings was enormous, especially last year with, you know, because we, we launched the solution probably eight months before COVID hit. Um, so we were still kind of get you know, realizing that ROI as, as the world shut down and, and business dried up. So uh, for us, being able to realize that cost savings, those cost savings at that time was enormous for the company. Uh, it was enormous from an IT perspective, um, just from a budgeting standpoint. So for uh, for us the the timing couldn't have better and the the uh the, just the the raw cost savings were were enormous um but again it proves out that that overall cloud strategy that we've got and the flexibility that we're hoping to take advantage of in the future perfect well french i really appreciate your time thank you so much for joining again it's always just great to hear from happy clients and we really really appreciate your time thank you that's been my pleasure pleasure thanks chris